All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your patience. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I want to say thank you all so much for coming to our event today, and I just want to, each and every one of you here to know that we, the Phoenix Club, genuinely appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm Mike Weirich, and I'm the chair of the Lynn Phoenix Club. If you're a first timer or a guest today, please know that we would love to have you as a member of our group. Uh, see one of us afterwards, uh, or you can go to our website, which is lynnphoenixclub.org for more information. And again, thank you for coming here on this Memorial Day weekend. Let's just do a quick moment of silence for all those that we've lost. Thank you. Most of you know about Lynn Phoenix Club, but just in case you don't, here's the story. Our mission is to get more Democrats elected in Lynn County. Uh, we do this by raising money through memberships and event fees, and then we give that money to our Democratic candidates in targeted countywide races where we think we can really help push those candidates over the finish line to a win. Why is this important? Well, you've seen, uh, you're starting to see this year what uh, the Democrats getting control of the National House has done for us. And we need that same type of thing to happen in Iowa. We either need to capture the Iowa House or the Iowa Senate or both in 2020. We just can't leave the GOP unchecked any longer. So I'd like to thank Raygun for hosting us today. I'd like to thank my board. Uh, again, go to lynnphoenixclub.org to find out more about who we are or if you'd like to get information on joining. And now I'd like to quickly introduce the elected officials here today uh, on my board, Ashley Van Orney. Ashley. <laughs> Former Mayor Kay Halloran. Representative Art Stade. <laughs> Representative Molly Donahue. <laughs> and Representative Liz Bennett. <laughs> there she is. Did I miss anybody? I think that's it. No. Oh, <laughs> former Representative Ro Fagy. All right, yeah. <laughs> And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, uh, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is the junior United States Senator from New York. She's been in that position since 2008. Before that, or I'm sorry, 2009. Before that, she was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 2007 to 2009. Senator Gillibrand is originally from Albany, New York, and her maternal grandmother was a founder of the Albany Democratic Women's Club. She graduated, I love that, right? She graduated from Dartmouth and received her law degree from UCLA Law School and uh, passed the bar exam in 1981. She's married and has two sons, the youngest of whom is 11, and rumor has it he is might he be... Shopping yeah, he's, he's around, right? Yeah, so you'll get to meet him in a minute, and his name is Henry, right? Henry. Yeah. Um, so in her law career, uh, Senator Gillibrand has said that her work at private law firms allowed her to take on pro bono cases defending things like abused women and their children and tenants, people who were uh, seeking safe housing after lead paint and unsafe conditions were found in their homes. 
after taking office for the first time in the House, Gillibrand became the first member of Congress to publish her official schedule, uh, listing everyone she met with on a given day. She also published earmark requests and received uh, and her personal financial statement. The Sunlight Report, as her office termed it, was praised as being a quiet touch of a revolution in a non-transparent system. As a member of the Democratic Party's relatively conservative Blue Dog faction, while in the House, Gillibrand has moved uh, her political positions and ideology towards a more liberal, progressive position since she's been in the Senate. She's gone against the party on a number of occasions on issues related to women's rights, declaring zero tolerance during, uh, excuse me, uh, de declaring a zero tolerance doctrine regarding accusations of sexual misconduct by members of Congress. She's, yeah, she's right, yeah, yes. She's run for office in some very conservative districts and she's won each of these races by a substantial margin. Everyone loves a winner, especially in 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Thank you, Mike. Nice. Well, thank you, Mike, for organizing this, for pulling us all together. Um, thanks to our elected leaders who are here, who are serving us every day. I'm very grateful for your public service. And thank you all for being here on Memorial Day weekend. Um, that's a lot to ask of any Democrat, so I just want to thank you for being the hardy type. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then why I'm running for president and then why I'm going to win. Uh, I, as Mike said, I got my start in politics uh, a long time ago in upstate New York, largely because I had a grandmother who loved politics. Now, my grandmother, um, she came from very modest means, born in the south end of Albany, never went to college, and worked every day of her life. She was a secretary in the state legislature. So you have to remember, 75 years ago, women had very little say in politics, and all the electeds were men. And so if she wanted to have a say, she realized she'd have to organize not just her own views, but the voices of many women. And so she founded the Women's Democratic Club. She organized all the women of the legislature and then all the women friends she had in Albany. And over time, these women got really invested in campaigns, uh, doing the door-to-door, -door, doing the envelope stuffing, doing the phone banking. And they eventually became powerful. In fact, by the time I was Henry's age, she couldn't get elected in Albany without the blessing of my grandmother and her lady friends. Uh, because these women did all the work, they did everything that it took to elect candidates that shared their values. So I got to grow up in a community where every fall I'd work on a campaign. We'd have the campaign's t-shirt, the candidate's face on it, we'd have bumper stickers. Uh, but my first political memory was going into a campaign headquarters at Henry's age and um, having a room full of ladies stuffing envelopes. and. For whatever reason, this stuck in my mind. I just remember being mesmerized by these women, and they were just stuffing envelopes and stuffing envelopes. And I'm watching them and looking at their arms and saying, their arms, they have such jiggly arms. Why are their arms so jiggly? And I'm thinking in my head, I really want to be just like them someday. So sure enough, jiggly arms, jiggly arms. We all get there someday. So I just loved it. I love the women. I love the people. I love the values. I love the goals. And it stuck with me in my heart that I always wanted to do public service. I didn't know how, and I didn't know when. I wind up going off to college, off to law school, and find myself in New York City as a lawyer in a big law firm. And what struck me at that moment was 1995 when Hillary Clinton went to China. And I remember watching this woman, our first lady, stand on a stage in Beijing and say, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights once and for all. And I really wished I was there. I wanted to be part of that conversation. I also was a little annoyed that I wasn't invited. I didn't know why I wasn't invited, but I figured out I wasn't invited because I wasn't involved in politics as an adult. Now, I wanted to be there because I was actually an Asian studies major at Dartmouth. I learned how to speak Mandarin from dorms in Beijing, so I really wanted to be there. And I knew how powerful it was for a first lady to give that speech at that time to that audience. And so that's what got me off the sidelines. I started to get involved. I started getting involved in local campaigns um, all through New York City, local state Senate races, gubernatorial campaigns, Senate campaigns, presidential campaigns. And the more I got involved, the more I really wanted to serve, the more I really wanted to move my life away from the law and into public service. 
Um, 10 years later, I finally had the courage to think about running. It took a long time. It's something that a lot of young women go through, this, this doubt that am I smart enough, tough enough, capable enough? And eventually you say yes, um, at least for some of us. And I called a friend who was a pollster because I didn't want to get in without having some certainty that I could possibly win. Uh, and it was actually Jonathan, when he does come up, um, I'm going to credit him with this because Jonathan's the one who said, you know, let's do a poll, honey. We'll, we'll spend our own money. Let's just see if we have a shot. So I called my friend who's a pollster and I said, you know, Jeffrey, I really want to run in New York 20 for Congress. Can you look it up? Tell me what you think and tell me if you can win. Tell me if I can win. And he looked it up and he said, no. I said, really, Jeffrey? That seems a little harsh. Um, I've been raising money for other candidates. I could raise $2 million. I can get my message out. He said, it doesn't matter. It's two to one Republican. There's not enough Democrats to vote for you. I said, well, you know, I could run the perfect campaign. You can't tell me that if I have money and run the perfect campaign, I can't win. And he just said, well, Kirsten, there's more cows than Democrats in your district. So no, you actually can't win. And being a lawyer and being competitive, I said, well, what happens if this guy gets indicted? I can't, I, 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 you can't tell me I can't win then, right? And he said, well, it depends what he gets indicted for. And little did I know that that statement is pretty true. We have literally in New York indicted Congress members that are still members of Congress, like no joke. So it was red, 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 and he didn't think I could win. Um, but one person believed in me, it was my mother, and that tells you a lot about my mother. So my grandmother did not leave my mother out when raising her right. Uh, my mother was a tough woman. She was a woman who went to law school ahead of her time. There was only three women in her class. Um, she was a woman, by the time she was my age, was a second degree black belt in karate. She'd come home on Tuesday nights with bruises all down her arms, and I'd look at her and say, Mom, I don't understand. Why don't you just play tennis like the rest of the mommies? Uh, but that was her thing. Uh, she was a mom who was a great, um, beautiful seamstress. She made us all our dresses when we were little. She was a great cook. She best pies you can imagine. Of course, she's a mom who liked to cook the Thanksgiving turkey, but unlike other moms, she also shot the Thanksgiving turkey. So I really had a very different experience in growing up with these two female role models. They were tough, they were confident, they believed in themselves, and they believed in the importance of women's voices. And so I, too, um, have always believed that. And so when I decided to run for Congress, um, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid at all. I can't tell you how many people, seasoned politicians, would come up to me and say, you know, Kirsten, this is such a tough first race. You know, we really think you should run for something else because this is not, you know, we don't want this for you. Because the opponent I had really was a bully. He was very tough and very mean. He never took me seriously. He dismissed, dismissed and demeaned me from the very beginning. He'd look at me and say, ah, she's just another pretty face. And I would say, thank you. And then I'd talk about why we needed to get our troops out of Iraq and why we needed health care as a right and not a privilege and why Medicare for all, even back then in 2005, was the best solution. Because I made the case that if you let people buy in at a price they can afford, it may be 4 or 5% of income, they actually can create competition with the insurance companies to drive down costs. And they'll get better coverage for less money, and it'll work. And people said, yeah, that makes sense, even in a two to one Republican district. I won that race, uh, and I won it by six points. I ran for re-election. Uh, the Republican Party at the time said, ah, it was a fluke. We just need a better candidate. So they put up a self-funder. The self-funder spends almost $7 million in negative ads. Mean ads, nasty ads, pictures of my face in red with flames coming out of my head and a very dark voice saying, she's not who you think she is. It was so bad. I mean, Theo, my 15-year-old, was only four at the time, three at the time. So we had to turn off the TV for three months because we didn't want him to see those ads. Like, that was not a good visual of his mummy. So uh, we turned off the TV. But we learned something, because in that election cycle, I was pregnant during most of it with Henry. And so we learned that you actually can't win a congressional campaign with negative ads against a woman with an infant and a toddler, because no one believes you. And so I beat him by 24 points. So I can win the red and purple areas. And when I became senator the next year, I was appointed because Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State. And our governor was looking for a candidate who could win upstate, the red and purple places, but also represent the whole state. Having been a lawyer for 15 years, I understood what was happening with the financial collapse. I could bring the state together. And that's exactly what I did. I ran three elections, 10, 12, and 18. 
My highest vote threshold was 72%. That's higher than President Obama, higher than Hillary Clinton, higher than any person who's ever run for Senate or governor in the history of New York State ever. In the last election in 2018, I won back 18 Trump counties without spending a dime on television. I won back those 18 Trump counties by doing 18 town halls, by doing uh, going to every one of our counties in the state, every one of the 62 counties. And so I can win just by talking to people, listening to their concerns, absorbing their concerns, worries, fears, and challenges, and finding bipartisan solutions to make their lives better. And I pass a lot of legislation. I don't succeed just electorally. I succeed legislatively. So in the last Congress with the Republican House, Senate, and President, I passed 18 bills. Common sense bills, the kind of bills that would help a place like Iowa. Money for rural broadband. Money for made in America manufacturing. Money for small businesses, particularly baby boomers who want to retire but their kids don't want it so they can sell those businesses to their employees so we can have more employee ownership, more growth, begin to deal with income inequality. So I bring people together. And I do it on a big stage and a small stage. I passed the first gay rights legislation, certainly in the last decade, with the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and I can tell you, it wasn't easy. I had to start with the Democrats. I can't tell you how many Democrats said to me at the time and looked me in the eye and said, you know, Kirsten, it's not convenient. Why are you doing this now? I'm a freshman senator. And I looked them in the eye and said, when are civil rights ever convenient? You do it because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> So I was able to get all the Democrats and find common ground with Susan Collins, and together we got the seven Republicans, and we repealed it. The 9-11 health bill was even harder. Um, people didn't want to send money to New York. They thought it was all about New York, and it wasn't. Every first responder, they came from every state in the country, every congressional district in the country. And so we had to bring the entire Congress together to pass that bill, but it was more than that. We brought the first responders to every office, and we made sure that we could talk about it uh, in the airwaves. The fact that we had Jon Stewart spend two episodes on it, CNN, MSNBC all covering it. What we didn't have was Fox News. So I went into the lion's den, went straight to Roger Ailes, sat down with Roger Ailes and said, listen, you say you're the party of first responders, show it. Show it by standing with them when they need our support. They need basic health care because they're dying of cancers because of all the toxins they breathed in when the towers fell because the EPA under George Bush told them the air was safe. I got Roger Ailes. And we learned another truism in politics when you have John Stewart on one side and Fox News on the other, you're gonna win. And so when we passed that bill, we ultimately passed it unanimously. So I get things done and, and I can bring people together. Now, now to the presidential. I think what President Trump has done in this country is absolutely destructive. He's created a divide and a, di a division on every racial, religious, socioeconomic line you can imagine. He's created fear, he's created anxiety, he's someone who demonizes the vulnerable, he's someone who demeans the weak, he's someone who actually punches down. And he does it because he wants you to believe he's strong, but he's not, he's weak. Our president is actually a coward. And I believe this country deserves I believe this country deserves a president who's brave, a president who will do the right things for the right reasons, a president who will go through fire to do what's right, and that is who I am. In my short career, I've taken on the Pentagon twice. First over Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and now over sexual violence in the military. I've taken on the banks as a member of Congress from New York. I voted against the bank bailout twice, even though both parties were throwing billions at them because I read the bill and I knew that it would leave taxpayers holding the bag. I vote against Congress. I actually stand up to the greed and corruption in Washington in many ways. First, by posting my earmarks, my schedule, my financial disclosure, and my taxes online. The first person ever to do all of that in Congress. First presidential candidate to post 12 years, all years of public service online of my taxes. And I passed a bill making insider trading illegal by members of Congress. I can't believe it wasn't the law already, but it wasn't. But I also know this, if we wanna do any of the things we've talked about, healthcare is a right, not a privilege, the Green New Deal, uh, more affordable college, debt-free college, better public schools, 
literally anything that we want to accomplish, if you don't take on greed and corruption in Washington, you're never going to get there. And that's why the first policy idea from my campaign was publicly funded elections. I believe that we need to get money out of politics. And until we get money out of politics, and until we take on the special interests, the drug companies, the insurance companies, the banks, the people who decide and determine everything in Washington, our voices won't be heard. We need to make sure that our voices are as loud as any Koch brother. But you need to do it by getting the money out of politics, restoring voting rights, and standing up to the greed and corruption that controls things. I am the candidate that will do that. I'm the only candidate who has a record of doing that exactly and standing up to the culture of corruption as well as the special interests that run everything in Washington. And I know I can do this as President of the United States and I also know I can bring this country back together again. Because at the end of the day, we must heal the nation, we must restore this moral integrity that's been lost, restore our leadership on the world stage, remind the American people we are so much stronger when we care about one another, when we treat others the way we want to, treat, we want to be treated, when we care about the least among us. That is what a good president will do. That is what a brave president will do. That is what I will do as president, and that is why I'm going to win. So, Mike, you're going to come up and call on folks? You can keep the microphone. I think okay. uh, most people can just hear me. So, the senator, thank you very much for your remarks, and she's agreed to answer some questions. Who has one? You guys want to come and sit? There's seats right in the middle, and you can ask questions. Anyone under 15 gets the first, second, or third question. So you get a privilege, and I love that book. It's one of my favorites. My question is a follow up. Yes. 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 I want to know how you're going to orchestrate that. Yes. How you can pull that off. Yes. Because we're going to have to admit it was a terrible blunder, and we're not good at admitting our mistakes. I don't think we need to um, say that specifically. I think what we, um, how are you going to get our troops out of Iraq? And do you have to say that it was a blunder? Um, my view is this. Um, I don't think we should have ever been in Iraq in the first place. Uh, I think President um, George W. Bush lied to the American people. I think he falsified the evidence of, of weapons of mass destruction for his own purposes to become a wartime president. Um, he foretold that when he gave his speech about the axis of evil. It's no surprise. Um, it's one of the reasons why I decided to run for Congress, because when I heard him give that speech, I was sitting with Jonathan and I just said, oh my God, he's going to bomb those three countries. I'm gravely concerned that President Trump is continuing the axis of evil, because if you remember, it was Iraq, North Korea, and Iran. Was it not? I believe it was. And so I think that President Trump wants to start a war in Iran. I think he's trying to saber rattle specifically, and it causes me grave concern. So I would draw down our troops from Iraq immediately, because they are not serving an anti-terrorism function that's as effective as other things we could be doing. So I would draw those troops down. I would draw them down from Afghanistan. The truth is the Iraqi government and the Afghanistan government have to create stability in their own countries. We've been training their troops for a long time. We've been supporting their, ser their service members for a long time. They're going to have to do it. We can do special operations missions when needed to deploy for certain anti-terrorism missions, but we do not need troops on the ground. We do not need thousands and thousands of troops. I don't think our troops should be in Syria. I don't think this president has the authority to have our troops in Syria. And I do not think we should be deploying the 1,200 troops that they've just admitted to that they want to send to the border regions of Iran. I think that is saber rattling. I think it will harm us and it will destabilize the region. You know, when I see President Trump's behavior, it often reminds me of a spoiled toddler. 
And so I would speak to him exactly as I would a spoiled child. When he starts to loom over me and come into my space, I will say, go back to your spot. Your space is over there. When he interrupts me, I will say, excuse me, it's not your turn. Wait your turn. And speak to him like the spoiled child that he is. Because he, he is not someone that I think we should get down in the mud with. I don't think... Um, name calling is as effective as actually calling out the behavior for what it is. And so I will do that because I believe if you're going to get in a fight with a pig and you get down into the mud with a pig, the pig has fun and you get dirty. So I would avoid the whole thing and I would just put him in his place, which is over there. Um, I'd just be very, very specific. And I think um, a lot of what's been going on between Speaker Pelosi and uh, President Trump, when she shines, it's largely when she dismisses him. When she says, don't define me, do not tell me you know, what I'm going to do, and no, we're not gonna give you money for that wall. When she dismisses him, I think she's at her most effective. restoring faith, morale, and integrity back in our beleaguered agencies like FBI, Homeland Security, yeah. CIA. Yeah. These folks work hard yeah. all the time defending us, but get beat down. How would yeah. you go about restoring that faith? Well, I would first of all thank them for their service. Um, they are all public servants, and uh, I would build them up and lift them up because the truth is they are trying to keep us safe. They are trying to protect this country. Uh, all of our first responders are. All of our intelligence agencies are. The second thing I would do is I have this idea. It's a big idea about how to get to debt-free college, and it's about national public service. I would ask America's youth, if you're willing to do a year of public service, we will pay for a, two years of community college or state school. If you're willing to do two years of public service, we're willing to pay for four years. And I would open up that public service to all our first responders, to our intelligence agencies, to the military. It's an expansion of the GI Bill. I would also include education, and I would include health care, because we have a crisis in needing more nurses, more home health aides, more early childhood educators, and more teachers. And so if you can open up those industries to young people, give them the chance to see what it feels like to spend your life serving others first, I think it changes their hearts, I think it changes their career trajectories, and I think it changes the character of the country in one generation. All the divisiveness and selfishness that President Trump has um, tried to evangelize, will fall away. Because he wants us to be afraid of one another. He wants us to fear our neighbors. He wants us to close our borders and build walls. But that is not who we are, and it's not who we've been in our best moments as a nation. So I think a call to national public service is an antidote to the hate, fear, and anxiety he's created. That's a very good idea. Thank you. I'm right here. Stop. Okay. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, <laughs> about Lizzo or about girls or about homeless? Stop. What's your favorite Lizzo song? Love that question. What is my favorite Lizzo song? <laughs> okay, it's time for karaoke. Who's got the, who's got the, put the song on. Come on, Alex, put it on. So it's the one that goes, is it I flip my hair back? Okay, it's something like, I flip my hair back, check my nails. Baby, how you feeling? <laughs> Thank you all. I, I think I saw that uh, those, there was a mess over there and you walked clear across the room and got some stuff, and your instinct was to clean up the mess. I think that's a little different than, say, a male candidate. Yes. Uh, and I, I will say, though, uh, I, I did uh, clean the kitchen floor after church today. I came up with my slogan. I'm running for pet president because I'm going to clean up the mess. Well, anyway, we have, we have a mess in agriculture. And uh, you didn't mention supply management, but supply management yes. with price floors yes. is what we need. Yes. 
Uh, we do have uh, Bernie Sanders come out with a strong position on supply management and price floors, and, I, and that he's really the only one that we've heard say much about it. But I'm sure you know, you know, it's not just for the Bernie Sanders type candidates no. to do this kind of thing. Uh, in, the, in here in the, our history, we had the, the Harkin Gephardt Farm yeah. Bill, yeah, yeah. which had that su su reduction in supply, and then it led, to, uh, it led to a much cheaper government program. You don't need any. Did Harkin Gephardt work? Uh, it, this is an econometric study of it, and it was not passed. It wasn't passed. It's that question of like civil rights, you know, yeah. that's, is it convenient to do it? Yeah. Some people will advise you. Uh, you wait till we win more power, but I see this as a way to win more power. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, farmers would make more money, we would make a profit on exports, we would make a lot more, more than 100 billion more on exports, according to that study, over you know, a certain period of time. Uh, and again, the government costs are way down compared to the Republicans. Yeah. So uh, uh, what about that for your campaign? Yeah. Can you be... Yeah, let me answer. I got you. Um, so I would like you to update these charts for me to bring them into today's di dollars so I can have it for, so I have a lot of information and knowledge, particularly on supply management and price floors for dairy. Because in New York State, we have three major um, production. We have dairy farming, we have fruits and vegetables and specialty crops, and we have organics. So those are the areas where I have a lot of expertise and I know how it works in those industries. I would love to look at what you just gave me, Harkin Gephardt, because the one person I truly trust on ag policy is Tom Harkin, because I got to know him over, over a few years when I first came to the Senate, so I'm very interested to see that. And I'll just explain it in dairy, and then you can do your own extrapolation for commodities. But the way dairy farming works today is really heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Men and women who work in dairy, they spend so much money to produce milk for our kids. But right now, the price of milk is set by the price of cheese in Chicago, which can be easily manipulated. And that price of milk they're getting is not even the cost of production. The price of milk they're getting is the same as they got in the 1970s or 80s. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's not keeping up with the cost of production, and they keep it artificially low. And it doesn't work for the farmer, and so what the outcome of this is consolidation. So we only have huge dairy farms now. Once you have consolidation, do you know how short the step is to outsourcing? It's really short. Because once you've consolidated, you will be bought by a multinational. Once you're bought by a multinational, if they think production's cheaper in Mexico or in China, off they go. And one of the biggest concerns I have in ag is we want to make sure that we produce our food here. It is absolutely imperative from a national security perspective that we always produce in the United States. And so I'm interested in this idea because it's a, it's a longer term goal. It's about parity, correct? Um, it's about uh, making sure that we set the price of what we grow and create that is determined by the cost of production and index to inflation. That it's not actually kept artificially low, but it actually goes up to cover the costs. So you don't have consolidation and you don't have outsourcing. Because we want small dairies, small farms to survive. In New York State, we've lost so many dairy farmers in the last 10 years, and unfortunately, the price of milk is so low, we have dairy farmers committing suicide. And I'm not kidding, it's really, devastating. And the, the margins are so small uh, because there isn't supply management, because there isn't a price floor. Um, the ones who can make money are the ones who have huge economies of scale. That's not good for food production. You want all si types of farming and you definitely want small farms and family farms. So I'm very f interested and I'm going to reach out to Tom Harkin about his idea and maybe I'll come up with a platform for commodities um, over the next weeks and months too. Yeah, just give it to me. I'm the ag specialist. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm very interested. Senator, we had a very bad flood here in 2008. Yes. We had flooding in the Mississippi, we had flooding in Missouri, and yet we can't get people to care about climate change. It's crazy. We need to move to renewables, and what can you uh, help us do to, to achieve that? So I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, I do believe that global climate change is the greatest threat to humanity that exists. Okay, so let's just start with that principle. If you have a threat to humanity that grave, that significant, that real, then you're gonna need a proposal that's big and bold enough to meet 
the urgency of the crisis. As president, I will restore our leadership on the world stage on the first day. I will reach out and reestablish the United States' role in the global climate accords, and I will lead the world's effort to attack and tackle global climate change. I will try to pass a Green New Deal, and I know how to do it because most of the components of the Green New Deal are already bipartisan. It's infrastructure, it's green jobs, and it's clean air, clean water, all of which are already bipartisan, all of which I've worked on for the last decade. Infrastructure, most obvious, roads, bridges, sewers, high-speed rail, rural broadband, a new electric grid, more mass transit, all things that would help Iowa, all things that would help all of America. Green jobs, teaching our kids STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, and then giving them the job training so they can be the inventors for cellulosic ethanol, the next generation of biofuels, so they can perfect wind energy, so Iowa can continue to lead in the wind energy revolution. Actually inventing and, and coming up with the technologies and the innovations that put us forward. We don't need a space race with Russia, but how about a green energy race with China? Why not use our leadership on the world stage to engage the whole world community to create a competition? Who's gonna figure it out first? Who's gonna build it bigger? Who's gonna make it more effective? That's what a president can do if they wanna lead. And this president doesn't wanna lead. So I will lead on this issue. Um, on clean air and clean water, last item, there's not a state who doesn't have fears and worries about tainted water. In Iowa, you've got nitrates. Can your farmers afford to clean up the water system? Absolutely not. So you're gonna need the federal government to come in and say it is a national mission to have clean air and clean water in every state. It'll create economic growth. Every time you clean up a Superfund site or a Brownfield site or clean up a water supply, what happens? industry grows, you have tourism, you have fishing, you have more homes, more resources, more people invest in those areas. It is an exponential economic investment. So those are the three components. The only thing new about the Green New Deal is the goal, net zero carbon emissions in 10 years. And all I say to that goal is it's a great organizing principle and an aspirational goal worth fighting for. Just like when John F. Kennedy said, I want to put a man on the moon in 10 years, he had no clue if he could get a man on the moon in 10 years, but he knew it was a great organizing principle. He knew it was a measure of our effectiveness and our innovation and how great we were as a nation. Why not do the same thing? And so I see it as something that just needs presidential leadership and it has to be the cornerstone of your administration. So my cornerstones, there's four cornerstones. One is green energy. One is getting money out of politics. One is building the economy through getting rid of underemployment, which you have a lot of here. And the other is building our healthcare system because it's the number one economic issue and concern for every single person in America. Hi. Belt it out. Oh, I'm going to use my notes. Go ahead. My name's Angie. I'm from Cedar Rapids, and I'm with Tax March Iowa. Tax March started as an actual march and now is a movement. This movement work is working to show lawmakers and presidential candidates that we want the wealthy to pay their fair share. Many candidates have said they would reject the Trump tax cuts that have that give tax windfalls to corporations and rich, very rich people. Do you support increasing taxes on the top 1%? And do you have a plan to repeal any parts of the Trump tax cuts? Yes and yes. Simple, direct, yes, yes and yes. So we know that those tax cuts overwhelmingly went to the ultra wealthy in this country. $1.5 trillion, most of it going to the ultra wealthy and the most successful companies. And they didn't invest the money in a way to create a growing economy. What did they do? They bought back their stock. What did they do? They paid dividends. Not, hey Henry, you just joined us, I just saw you. <laughs> this is Henry everybody. Henry's here. So I love the t-shirt. Look, he got a sweatshirt. Look, 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 Reagan, he's got his merch. Very nice, Hen. Okay, so back to your question. Um, yeah, so I would roll back the 1.5 trillion. The only parts I would keep in place are the middle class tax cuts. Um, there was a lot of damage in that tax bill. Took away state and local deductions, which for some states was crushing. Um, that has to be fixed. And so I would start there. 
Um, but I would also do some other things. And one idea for uh, how to pay for the stuff I talked about today, the ending underemployment um, through, na through uh, job training and also the national public service idea, I would do a transaction tax. And I'm only, only one of two presidential candidates who would consider a transaction tax. And it doesn't, it doesn't disrupt much except for the flash traders. And the flash traders, honestly, they don't create value. Um, the whole business model is based on how close your server is to the exchange, literally, because it's in fractions and fractions of milliseconds that they make their money. And they distort stock prices. We used to look at the stock market. It used to reflect the, the value of a company. No more. So I would do a transaction tax, just pennies on the hundreds of dollars, and that would actually raise $77 billion a year, which is more than enough to pay for the things that I talked about today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Unfortunately, that needs to be our last question. I'm sorry, um, but I want all of us to put our hands together and thank Senator Gillibrand for being here today. question I promised what inspired you to want to be president <laughs> so I have been inspired over the last two years by the bravery of everyday people um, men and women who have been marching on Washington because this president is taking us in the wrong direction, from the Women's March, for men and women who march globally, for the Science March to end global warming, uh, from the young kids who are running to, end, to march to end gun violence. Those everyday acts of bravery inspire me to be brave too. And that's why I'm standing up, for the, standing up to the president. It's why I voted against him more than any other person in the U.S. Senate, and it's why I'm going to beat him. Again, thank you so much. Thank all of you for taking some time out of your Memorial Day weekend to come and join us today. If you aren't already on the Lynn Phoenix Club mailing list or emailing list, please come see me after this and we'll get that fixed up. You can also like us on Facebook. It's a good way to stay on top of what we've got going on. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the rest of your weekend. And thank you again, Senator Gillibrand. Appreciate it. there next week, so great. Um, okay. Okay. Alrighty, so did I miss something or do you normally take requests when people ask you to sing or is, is this a singer? Is no, a it was a brand new request, first time <laughs> ever. And I'm glad I had an answer because I do love Lizzo. If I didn't know Lizzo, I'd been in so much trouble. Um, okay, so your family bill of rights, obviously, rural healthcare, gynecology, um, very much needed in Iowa. I have several friends who went to medical school at Iowa and then pursued specialties, but a lot of them really don't want to go out to those rural areas. Are the grants, do you think there'll be enough to attract them to I the do. area? So there's a couple of ways to get doctors to come to other areas. There is debt forgiveness, which is a fantastic tool to use for doctors who will serve in underserved areas, such as rural areas. Um, grants to be able to pay them more so you can compete with the larger hospital networks and the larger cities that might pay more. Um, and then training, just to make sure that you have additional resources to do training programs so that who you do bring in can have the state-of-the-art training in obstetrics and in gynecology. You obviously have your position very well with, you know, 10 years in the Senate. Um, and Given that it's an extremely crowded field, I've been out to several of these presidential um, candidates early, and a lot of them are like, you know, hope you take a chance on me. Yeah. You are saying, I will win. I'm yes. confident. Given that it's so crowded, where does that come from, and how, in a practical sense, is that going to look going forward? Yeah, because a lot of candidates uh, who are running don't have my story. I've actually won red and purple areas of my state. I've won a red district, a two-to-one Republican district. I won it twice, first time by six points, second time by 24 points. And I've never lost those 10 counties since. And even in the 2018 election, I won back 18 Trump counties without spending money on television, just by doing town halls and going to all 62 counties in New York. I have the highest vote total in the history of the state, higher than President Obama earned, higher than Hillary Clinton earned, higher than any person who's ever run for Senate or governor, because I bring people together. I can win the red places, the blue places, and the purple places. 
When, when do you think that's going to reflect in the polls? Soon, because the truth is, it's a marathon and not a sprint, and it is so early. I don't think any of the people who won the presidency in the last few elections were ahead at this point in the campaign. Uh, some of them were, were very far behind. But even among the polling, um, I'm top 10 out of 20, two, three candidates, uh, so we're not in a bad place. I just have to keep letting voters get to know me so they can hear why I'm running, what I've done, what my vision for the country is, and the experience I have to get stuff done. I think that will um, win over their support, and so I'm confident that Iowans will see through the buzz of any given candidate, go to the substance of who is the best candidate, and who can bring the country back together again. And I trust the process. I know Iowans take their first in the nation, um, caucus very seriously. I think the fact that places like New Hampshire take their first in the nation primaries very seriously. And I think those are places where I will do well. Thank you. The proposal, the Green New Deal has been very you know, divisive, I guess you might say, or has received a lot of negative pushback uh, from Republicans. But you talked about how it's really bipartisan when you break it down. Yeah. Flesh that out. How, how do you, and, and especially when you're talking about like farmers not being able to afford to clean up the waterways. Yeah and making that a federal issue. How, how do you do that and, and get support to do it? So all the ideas under the Green New Deal are bipartisan and I've passed bipartisan legislation in all of them. In infrastructure, last Congress I passed money for rural broadband, something that would really help Iowa. Um, Green air, clean air and clean water, obviously getting funds to clean up brownfield sites, to clean up uh, water sources that are tainted, would really help Iowa and it would help farmers specifically so they'd have more resources to do the environmentally sound things that they'd love to do if they had the funds. And then third, um, focusing on green jobs, making sure our community colleges, our state schools, our apprenticeship programs really hone skills in science and technology and engineering and math so we have the skills that we need to be the entrepreneurs of coming up with new industries as well as refining ones that exist. How about getting our biofuels to have cellulosic ethanol, really figuring out the technology. How about making sure Iowa stays as one of the leaders in wind energy um, through technology and innovation. Resources can be provided for technology and for research to get us where we need to be to defeat global climate change. And there's no place like Iowa who's not felt it. We've seen these floods, these hundred year floods coming now every few years, devastating families and farms, uh, killing people, uh, destroying communities. We have the evidence right in front of us and we see uh, the impacts and we know if we invest in global climate change, uh, we, can, we can be successful and this country can lead the world. Guys. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, Rachel. See you. See you next see time. You. Yeah. <laughs>